Okay, everybody, we're going to start. If everyone could take your seats. Hi, Cheryl. <laughs> Careful of the tripod, Jasa. Okay, uh, really welcome everyone to my favorite day of the entire year. Uh, I'm John Coonrod. I'm the executive president of the Hunger Project, and I was its first volunteer. And um, so today we are going to walk through 40 years of human history and the strategic role that the Hunger Project has played in that history. Um, so, uh, next slide. Um, I, I, think, I, I think you'll be okay. We can close maybe just the first level of curtains. Okay, so all you tweeters out there, Facebook posters, Instagrammers, please share this. Share it from our Facebook Live on facebook.com slash the Hunger Project. Uh, we're live streaming this event for the first time. Uh, Rami, our ace technical guru, digital engagement officer at the Hunger Project, is uh, going to make all this work. Um, these are hashtags you can use. Also, if you would please silence those cell phones, it'll be so much easier to use them for tweeting if they're not making noise. Uh, so, welcome. And uh, the purpose for today is, as I said, to retake or some of us to take this journey such that we really embody it, that we really are able to let in what has been happening in our world and the strategic ways in which our hunger project have participated in it. So if you are participated in, started participation in the first decade of the hunger project, raise your hand. Woohoo! We got a lot of oldies here. So if you started in the second decade, 87 to 97, raise your hand. Whoa, we got a few of those. So if you started after 97 in the third decade of the Hunger Project, whoo, okay, great. And then if you joined us in this fourth decade, uh, raise your hands. Whoa, this is great. And if this is your first ever Hunger Project event, you don't have to raise your hand, but we'd love to know. Is anybody here for the first time? Oh, this is wonderful, thank you so much. So um, one of the mysterious attributes of the Hunger Project is that this, I invite you to own this whole 40 year history of the Hunger Project. Um, whether or not you've in the Hunger Project or just in the world or not even yet born, your world has been undergoing a lot of huge, huge transformative shifts over these 40 years that uh, the world community is now committed will actually bring us to the sustainable end of hunger by 2030. So that's a big shift in the world. And uh, we're going we're gonna to walk through it one, at, one year at a time. Um, next slide, Rami. Yeah. So we have, we have um, um, I, I really wanted to pay tribute uh, to several of our colleagues who lost this year, Barbara Rose, Nancy Groban, and uh, my dear, dear friend, a man I love more than any other, Idris Adiko. And as I was reflecting on today and thinking, my God, what a legacy this man has left. The inspired, uh, capable leadership all over Africa that he has inspired and brought into the Hunger Project and who are now making such a big difference in their country. And then to all of us who, uh, how many of you here have been on an investor trip with Dr. Deco? Yeah, a whole bunch of us. To be able to um, take, be, Ah, somebody didn't silence their cell phone. I, so uh, the, 
those of us who've been introduced or been able to see Africa, because we're all human beings have come from Africa, to be able to experience that with Dr. Deco is a legacy that we carry forward. So uh, this human history and hopefully the end of hunger will be all of our legacy. And when I think of my legacy and the legacy that we will all leave, I am thinking right now of Dr. Deco. So next slide, Rami. Yay, okay. Now, this is how I think of human history. So there are huge currents, giant waves of human history made up of the, ti as, uh, the tiny decisions made by every individual on this planet every day. Those form this huge currents and tides of history. And we... Okay, we're back. We're riding the wave, the, the, the uh, Facebook Live wave. But literally, the Hunger Project very intentionally has from the very beginning seen itself as playing this kind of, of role, uh, a leadership role, a bold role, sometimes some would say crazy role, but a role in participating in human history in a way to move as much of the forces of the world in the direction of ending hunger as we possibly could. So that is the 40 years, and we'll look at it both in terms of, of the uh, changes in human history, the bigger wave, as well as what the Hunger Project has been doing strategically as we go through these decades. Next slide, Rami. So, where did the end of hunger first start to be talked about? It was this guy. Even before, even before uh, the US entered World War II, um, Franklin Roosevelt, in his inaugural, uh, began to create a vision for a, a, a new future for all humanity. And he gave what's called uh, the Four Freedom Speech. Next slide. And he called for a freedom of speech and expression, freedom to worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. And those, next slide, those became solidified in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by Eleanor Roosevelt, another brave, courageous person who fought tooth and nail, was able to bring everyone together all kinds of cultures and different perceptions because the whole concept of human rights is not obvious to all people. Or the, that we are, as human beings, have inalienable human rights, not given to us by a government, but because we are human. That whole concept, uh, the basis of the enlightenment of the 18th century, really got turned into international treaty law in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, in terms of actually ending hunger, uh, nobody at that time, frankly, thought that could possibly happen. Uh, but it was, uh, it was there. The place for us to stand was there. I have the next slide. Now, happened in the 60s and 70s. See that young man on the far left there? Anybody know who he is? What? Swaminathan. Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, who we know as an older man, um, he pioneered the Green Revolution, which literally um, made it conceivable that there was plenty of food in the world, that no one was going to bed hungry because there wasn't enough food anymore, whereas before that, there were serious food shortages regularly, famines in India due to food shortages. That came to an end in the Green Revolution, uh, for which uh, the man next to him, Norman Borlaug, uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize and 
our future board chair, Dr. Swaminathan, um, won the first World Food Prize. Next. Now, shortly after this miracle of the Green Revolution, there was a horrendous famine in newly independent Bangladesh. Uh, some of us will remember George Harrison doing the first big concerts uh, for that famine. And this was clearly a man-made famine, clearly caused by human beings. And it was an outrage. Uh, next slide. It led to the first Rome World Food Conference in 1974, where the concept of ending hunger at that time, their goal was in 10 years, was first articulated by Henry Kissinger. Now, the world greeted that with a lot of skepticism, but also uh, with a lot of serious study for the first time in what would it take to end hunger. One of the people who was in the Bangladesh, <laughs> one of the people who was in the Bangladesh famine as a volunteer was a man named Robert Fuller, president of Oberlin College. Robert Fuller um, was, became an ending hunger activist during, as a volunteer during the Bangladesh famine. He lobbied all kinds of people, pushing them to uh, do something about this horrific thing. He pushed on then Governor Jimmy Carter through his friend Chip Carter. He, pushed, he joined the board of the Est Foundation and pushed it. And um, he, uh, Next slide. In the wake of that, new organizations were born. In the wake of that declaration, organizations were founded, including the Hunger Project, that were not going to be charity as usual. Everybody knew at the time of that Bangladesh famine that something different had to be done. And a number of groups, our cohort of organizations, many of whom we still work with today, were born. Uh, next slide. So, um, at the pushing of Robert Fuller, uh, the Est Foundation funded a film, a film called The Hungry Planet. And it was about this fellow. Who's this guy? Roy Prosterman. Roy Prosterman was a, uh, a, is still, to this day, a wonderful activist for land rights. He saw that to make sure that women could own land, that they'd be secure in their land tenure was really key to ending hunger. And they made this wonderful film. And on February 14th, 1977, they brought that film to a meeting of the Est Foundation. Um, Werner Earhart, uh, John Denver was there, Dana Meadows was there, Robert Fuller, who's in the upper left, Roy. And they showed the film. And, uh, at the end of the film, there was a huge debate. Uh, everybody, it was very controversial. Is it about land? Is it about military security? Is it about grassroots? Big debate ensued, I'm told. I wasn't there. Um, and at one point, Werner Earhart pounded the table and said, look, someone's going to have to take responsibility for this. I'll take responsibility, and we'll create a project for people to take responsibility for ending hunger in the world. So um, now I heard about that meeting the next morning and wrote in. I said, hey, I'm your guy. I want to volunteer. And they said, well, there's nothing to volunteering yet. And then a month later, they hired Joan Holmes, our then interim general manager, to uh, birth the Hunger Project. And I volunteered for her. And I would go in uh, at, while I was in graduate school, and I would read through reports. And next slide. And this I found buried in the middle of a 500-page report. This is from the National Academy of Sciences. And it concluded that hunger could be ended within a generation. And those of us who um, were in the first decade of the Hunger Project, we probably quoted this a gazillion times to people. Because from a technical and scientific perspective, it was clear to these, all these nutrition and agricultural scientists that hunger could be ended within a generation. So, the Hunger Project starts with 
and it continues to start every morning and often all night with the commitment to the end of hunger. We have the recognition that it's not primarily a technical or financial problem, it's a human problem. Hunger persists in the way that we act, that we live, that we be as human beings, and how we organize ourselves as human, the human community. The, um, we also knew that nobody knew the answer. There was no the answer. Ending hunger would have to be a plan in action. And that we would always have to be out on that surfboard watching that wave. And we would be guided by the question, not what's wrong, but what's, because there's lots wrong, I promise you. But what's missing? What's missing, which if provided, would enable all humanity to make a quantum leap forward in ending hunger? And how could we help provide what was missing? So that, from 1977 to this day, has been the guiding question of the Hunger Project throughout all this history. So, next slide. We are going to look at these four decades. In the first decade, it was called the era of promise. We wanted to call forth the global commitment to the end of hunger, to get people aligned behind that commitment, and to have that commitment be the context for all the work that's being done to end hunger. In the second phase, uh, called the era of opportunity, it was to provide the, what was missing then, which was holistic, integrated, bottom-up approaches to ending hunger, to giving people opportunity to end their own hunger. Uh, the third phase was we really came to grips with the depths of gender discrimination as a fundamental root cause of hunger and poverty in our world. And in this uh, fourth era that we're still in, it's probably gonna be longer than a decade, we have really looked at what will it take to ensure that these strategies, gender-focused, community-led strategies, reach everybody that it needs to reach. So those are the four decades. Um, you've got 40 years now in one slide, and then we're gonna walk through them. So how does that sound? Great, okay, good. Next slide. So um, we, at various times, love the tagline, unleashing the human spirit for the end of world hunger. But what do we really mean by that? Next slide. So we mean it starts with a transfer. What is leashing the human spirit? So what is leashing the human spirit? One big thing is our own mindsets. And a mindset is not um, an idea that you think, it's a set of sort of assumptions or ideas that shape the thinking that you have. These are not the ideas you often think, they are the ideas that think you. That it's the prevailing mindset. And um, at various times, it's been clear what mindset was leashing the human spirit and transforming that mindset it, and freeing people's innate creativity and drive and um, determination and intelligence, that's what we mean by unleashing the human spirit. Next. So the first decade, anybody remember this guy? Brad Caesar, star, chair of the New York City Committee. Um, uh, so this work was in many ways an answer to the fundamental question that Buckminster Fuller, who you saw earlier, po posed at our launching events. He said, what can the little individual do that no government, organization, institution can do? And uh, clearly changing that mindset is uh, something that each of us must do. And we can, in conversation with others, facilitate other people transforming their mindset. So we recently, very recently Jenna facilitated meetings with uh, some branding consultants, and they were looking at 
what's at the heart of the hunger project and they kept coming up with we transform mindsets and it is something that we do, do every day next so the mindset that we confronted um, when we launched the hunger project uh, was the mindset that hunger was inevit inevitable that there were no solutions and that it was caused by scarcity even though at that time, none of those thing, three things were true. There was abundant food. There were quite a few examples of successful work to end hunger. And so it wasn't at all inevitable. So transforming that mindset was um, what we did. Next slide. Um, so in 1978, uh, we formed committees. And we enrolled people in the Hunger Project. Um, and uh, I wanted to call on a couple of people who were awesome during that period. If you mic runners, are you ready to run your mics? Great. Okay, Joanna Ryder and Faye Freed. Actually, if you want to just come up here, then the whole world can see you. This is fine. Whichever you like. Hi. <laughs> um, wow. So 1978, I was living here in New York, and I was a member of the volunteer committee. And I remember the very first time that we went out to enroll people. So there were about four of us. And we really didn't know what that meant, go out and enroll people. But we ended up at the corner of Broadway and 72nd on the Upper West Side. And that was a very busy corner. Somebody had a card table that they brought and the only materials we had were the enrollment cards and one or two of the original source documents. And we stood there. Nobody was coming up to us. We weren't sure what to say. We didn't have a script. <laughs> it's like, so finally one of us got up the nerve, you know, and we interrupted somebody walking by and said, hi, have you heard about the Hunger Project? And of course then nobody had heard about it. And if they were generous enough to listen, we would, you know, just create it in the moment uh, about ending hunger and invite them to enroll. And uh, after a couple of hours, I think we really couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> so we, but, but we had enrolled some people, so we gathered up our cards and we were very proud of ourselves. And, you know, that was the beginning. And within a matter of months, we were everywhere. Grand Central, uh, Central Park, down in the village, out in front of the movie theaters. I mean, you name it, every weekend there would be a group of us out there, whether it was snowing or hot or whatever. So that was one of my early memories. Um, well, thank you. So, Faye. Hi, everyone. I'm Faye Freed. She's the lady I, I would send those cards to. From uh, well, so... Uh, November 1977, there we were at the Cow Palace in San Francisco. Uh, and sure enough, as most of us did, I signed that little sand-colored card that simply said, I, I will take responsibility for the end of hunger as an idea whose time has come at 25. And I went to work 
on the seventh floor of the California Street Building where the Hunger Project had a little corner office and I answered the phone. Good morning, the Hunger Project. And, uh, and so it was. But then that didn't seem quite enough uh, since I was responsible. And so um, it was in September of that year that I decided it might be a great idea to go on staff. So I was a gardener, I was a landscapist, and I went into the office for my interview with the interim manager, Joan Holmes. And uh, that was one of my earliest memories. I, first of all, I arrived at the office and I looked down and I had sandals on and my feet were dirty. I had come from my gardening job and it was challenging. I was now going into Joan's office and my feet were dirty. And she didn't really have much to say to me. I remember her asking me one question. And the question was, are you a fanatic? <laughs> and lo and behold, out of my mouth came the answer, yes. <laughs> and that was the beginning. It was then later known that no one would really see me in the office because those 350,000 sand-colored cards were sitting on my desk like this and I was behind them and it was my job to count them. I understood nothing of the computer system and anyway from there we decided you know we're gonna wait for the A-team. Oh we really don't know anything but we are fanatics. So that's how it began. Thank you. So um, this is how today is going to go. Uh, we have, in any given year in the Hunger Project, we could spend nine hours. So I have just picked a few iconic uh, milestones in each year. And at a number of times, uh, I've asked a few people to share their experience. If you have a year in which you want to share something, figure out how to do it in a minute, since we don't have, we have a lot. To hear people today. Um, put up of any, this is, it's hard to remember Times Square, that was like the biggest sign. Now Times Square is just a huge, huge bunch of signs. But we put that idea everywhere. At that little enrollment table that was up a moment ago, three of the first people I enrolled in my committee went on to de dedicate their entire careers to ending hunger. So um, this led to all sorts of people um, through that simple act of signing a card and uh, committing oneself, people literally changed their whole careers. Particularly, it was very strategic catching incoming freshmen as they got off the bus at Princeton University. A lot, that's the people who changed their careers on the, out of the enrollment card. Um, next slide. So, so there were, there were running teams, there were marathons, there were bus signs, there were bumper stickers. When, when Faye said we were going to make the end of hunger an idea, his time has come, we really did it with everything we could. Um, and it all depended on us, on little individuals. You know, Buckminster Fuller had this saying uh, about this planet of ours, uh, Spaceship Earth. He said, there's no room on Spaceship Earth for passengers, we're all the crew. And so um, us, we uh, fanatics, um, and we grew in number very quickly. Uh, next slide. Um, then there was a famine. And uh, in Cambodia, where the U.S. had no diplomatic relations following the Vietnam War and Vietnam's invasion of Cambodia. No one knew what was going on. We knew that there was a horrific famine going on, and there was no official response. And um, uh, Harry Chapin, the famous folk singer, sat down with Joan Holmes, who had just started the Hunger Project, and yelled at her. 
So Joan, you're working on world hunger. You've got to handle this. And Joan said, uh, okay. And she, um, she, um, she called her friend, Jim Grant, who later went on to run UNICEF, who called his friend, President Carter, and they had a White House summit on the famine in Cambodia, and a response happened. Uh, the Hunger Project took out ads uh, that we all pitched money into and we bought ads, not for the Hunger Project, but to raise money for those groups who were on the ground in Cambodia doing the famine relief. And um, we discovered that something else was missing, in that every group we talked to said, oh yeah, give us the money, we're the only group working in Cambodia. And we heard that from 12 different groups. So there was clearly something missing in terms of alignment. Um, now, the very next year, there was another famine, this time in Somalia. And again, there was no uh, international response. And Joan has these amazing insights. She realized, if we do this again, no one will want to give because they assume that the last time didn't work. So first we have to actually wake people up to the fact that something worked. So next slide. So on Thanksgiving Day in 1980, we again put up money and enrolled newspapers to, to run this ad on Thanksgiving all across America, letting people know that it had worked, that the Cambodia famine had stopped. And then the next week, we launched our campaign for getting the response to end the famine in Somalia, and that worked. So it's, um, again, you know, on this wave, those waves hit you this way, and then they hit you this way, and you find the highest leverage action you can take to stay on that board. Okay, next. So with this uh, problem of the hunger response community, we organized a big symposium uh, more than 100 of us volunteers were on the team. We, we had some amazing, uh, Virginia Weiss, some of you may recall, she was able to crack whips on big teams of us volunteers, and we had members of Congress, we had experts, we had all kinds of people together for a three-day retreat, the goal of which was to create a unified voice on these issues, to speak with one voice on the hunger issue in the United States. Um, it, it took years, but that turned into Interaction, which is today the world's largest alliance of international organizations speaking with one voice um, in America. And it's, of course, only one of 75 such national NGO coalitions around the world. But it was something we made happen. And a lot of us as little volunteers picking people up at the airports help make that happen. We also had, um, during the presidential election that year, we had ending hunger um, info centers at the Republican and Democratic conventions to make this known. Next. Um, that's me, in case you didn't recognize me. Uh, that came, the other thing we realized is that, um, as Joanna said, we, all we knew is that we wanted to end hunger. We were not sophisticated scholars on the solutions to ending hunger, and we really needed to be. You know, we were walking into congressional offices, we were walking into uh, newspaper offices, and uh, we needed to know what we were talking about. So the Hunger Project lo uh, created the Ending Hunger Briefing. How many people here were Ending Hunger Briefing, briefees, or briefing leaders? Woohoo! Anyone want a, a one minute share on being an ending hunger briefing leader, what that was like? Yes, please. Take the mic. I signed the card in 1985, and um, uh, Raquel was in the booth that did it. She said, I signed the card. My life was going this way. 30 seconds later, it was going this way. And um, she took me to an Ending Hunger briefing leader, uh, I mean, a briefing. And um, three months later, I was an Ending Hunger briefing leader. And um, two years later, I was on staff of the Hunger Project right. with the People to People Initiative. So um, 
I really got for the first time, it's possible. And it lived in me in a way that nothing had ever lived into me before. So yeah. it changed my life. Thank you. Thank you. We had, we had this mantra that the Hunger Project takes complex issues filled with controversy, the, the pea soup of controversy, and we transform it into something that's clear, finite, and confrontable without shortchanging the challenge. And that's, that is a leadership skill that all of us in the Hunger Project have probably needed to call from ourselves. It's very easy to sort of go down this rabbit hole of controversy and complexity. But um, in leadership for the end of hunger, we need to make it clear, finite, and confrontable. Uh, next. So um, in, in 1982, 83, we took this thing global. We created hunger projects um, in, all over the world, in Mexico, in uh, the UK, in uh, lots and lots of countries. And um, it, uh, this is an early global conference. There are people there from a whole bunch of countries. Um, the fellow sitting on the chair leading the meeting, Jay Greenspan, uh, you'll run into him tonight, I think, at the dinner. He was kind of the field commander for this global network of, of uh, volunteers all over the world generating this commitment. Um, next slide. Um, here are some of the enrollment cards in a whole mess of languages. Here's a mighty enrollment table in Japan. Next slide. And probably the most important thing that happened that year was that we called forth, and Joan actually literally picked up and moved herself to India to call forth the Hunger Project, the commitment to the end of hunger, in the country with the most hunger in the world and where the prevailing mindset was, we have no hunger here. We stop famines, we have a green revolution, we have no hunger here. So uh, that mighty hunger project India um, uh, exists to this day and um, is uh, making enormous progress, but it began uh, with enrollment cards on the streets. Next slide. Then there was another famine. And it was even bigger. And there was, again, initially for more than a year and a half, no response. Uh, Joan Holmes and John Denver and a quite a illustrious delegation traveled all over Africa. And uh, they talked to people um, in di lots of different contexts. And what they heard um, had us and the Hunger Project awaken to something else that was missing. We in the West had this idea that if there was just more foreign aid, if there was just more commitment from us rich people, then hunger would be ended. And the people in Africa told us time and time again, hey, you all could triple your foreign aid and you might make things worse because the policies of our governments, the marginalization of farmers, the, um, the, the particularly the marginalization and mistreatment of women farmers is so severe that it might make matters worse and that we need something, we need something else, something else is missing. Um, so we began studying that, uh, but it was a real wake up call uh, because that was not, there was a part of our mindset that we hadn't been awake to before that time. Next. The book. Uh, so as part of our whole commitment to educate ourselves as a global volunteer network, we published this great big book. And we did, uh, we did all kinds of events around the world. We walked into all kinds of offices. This is our then board member, M.S. Swaminathan, presenting it to President Corazon Aquino of the Philippines. Um, next slide. This is Kit and Rakol Tackett presenting it to then Governor Clinton. Um, this is our team in Switzerland presenting it to Reza Gorbachev. This got us in a lot of doors. And I live in Washington, D.C. I still walk into offices where that book is on the shelf and the person says, Hunger Project, aren't you the people that did that book? 
I mean, we, we pushed that book on the issue of hunger out everywhere, everywhere. And um, anyone knows, from my perspective, the most important aspect of those book events? I met Carol. I, <laughs> so Carol and I met producing uh, book events, and uh, we lived happily ever after. <laughs> yes, please, Nancy. Take the mic. I just wanted to say, I, I'm Mary Earl Chase, and you saw up there the a picture of the shift in the wind. That was the newspaper that ended up going, this is before Facebook, everything, <laughs> uh, 1.5 million people were receiving that newspaper in the, in the early yeah. 80s. And it was all from those cards getting into the, and, the, and their addresses getting into the system and uh, sending it out, and it was... Um, uh, uh, the team that put that together with me is uh, Neil Rogan and Ron Lansman, and we're all here to uh, be celebrate with everybody 40 years later. Mary, 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 tell us why it was called a shift in the wind. Get, get, take the mic. Take the mic. Do I know that? Oh, if well, you don't, I do. So that's. It. I know that it was Neil. I think that came up with the title. Uh, and he has such a way with words, but that was what we were meant to do. We were meant to shift the wind around hunger and starvation. And, um, and I think it was just a perfect name, and it really, yeah. uh, it really worked. Yeah, he, he uh, took the title from a statement by Dick Gregory, the comedian and activist, who at the launching event said, uh, you know, I've all heard it said from firefighters who are fighting forest fighters that, you know, really, we've done all we can do. We, we'll lose the whole forest unless there's a shift in the wind. And that... Yeah. Thanks, I'm glad you remembered. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next slide. So uh, we began learning about African leadership. Uh, we began trying to find examples of good leadership, sharing the newspapers. Uh, we started attending more UN meetings. We got our UN uh, clearance. We realized that we were going to have to do something new, that we were approaching the end of the first era of the Hunger Project, the era of promise. So um, with that, I want everybody to stand up and wiggle your fingers. That's very lovely. Okay, now we're going to a team get ready. We're going to do a little participatory exercise. Um, you are to be presented a, a copy of a real live Hunger Project enrollment card. Let's move past, fast. Come on team, pass out those little stacks of cards, one per row. If you need a pen, you're welcome to have one. Just one pile per row, they should be all ready to go. Okay, and on the left-hand side, you'll see this is not a 1977 card. This is a 1982 one because we took Joanna's advice and gave people a script. The script is on the left. So um, everybody get a partner. Quick, everybody get a partner. And pick an A and a B. And A's... You're the enroller, B, you're the normal person on the street. Enroll each other in the Hunger Project.
Did you walk over? No, this one, fine. Okay, let me know when you're done. Wave your hand or something. You're done. You're fit. Whatever. Please stop. If they'd only had an email address spot on um, <laughs> we would be interested in them. Okay. <clears throat> How was that? Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Next slide. Who is this? Any... Um, all, all of the people and lots of experts from around the world were on the satellite event. Oh. It's going in and out. Let's take two of them, shall we? So I'll be like the TV guys and I have two of them on. And thanks for saying, because, you know, I'm sure there's somebody watching it on Facebook. If not, they can watch it tomorrow. Okay, um, anybody remember what Raul Julia's last lines were at that big event? I knew you would. Please give Jim Witten a microphone. What's remarkable is I remember them, and I wasn't even there. Right. <laughs> Thank you. If I get the order right, something like, if not me, who? If not now, when? If not this, what? Very good. A, a devoted Catholic quoting Rabbi Hillel. So um, this, uh, this event identified that what was missing was a new era, an era of opportunity, where people would have the opportunity they needed to end their own hunger. And what was missing was uh, leadership, management, and the kind of strategy that would uh, make that possible. Now, we had no idea at that point what that would look like. The Hunger Project gets out on the front of that wave in that surfboard and um, we started talking to lots of experts and um, people expert in strategic planning, people experts in government, because everybody on that stage promised that we would deliver that, whatever that was. Next slide. Um, to call forth the committed leadership that Africa needed to end hunger, we launched the Africa Prize for Leadership that year. Um, in fact, we launched it two weeks, uh, six weeks before the big launching event. And uh, this was a radical move. I mean, who were we to start giving prizes? But it had an enormous impact on, on um, putting a spotlight 
on not only leaders who were political leaders, which was the only, which was the mindset in Africa. Oh yeah, there's only one top man leader to seeing that women were leaders, that grassroots people were leaders, that teachers were leaders, that, uh, that there were leaders in every sector of African society, and they were doing great things. And so we put a spotlight on that to call it forth. Uh, next slide. Um, two things happened during that early time. Uh, we created a new workshop in India, the Commitment and Action Workshop. And a man took that workshop uh, who had walked with Gandhi. He had been, uh, uh, Pro Professor Ramlal Parikh had been head of the uh, youth movement of India's freedom movement. And now he was chancellor of a university and he took our workshop. And, he, and at the end, he took a stand and he said, I will end hunger in 161 villages of my Taluka, which is a sub-district, like a county in uh, Africa, uh, sorry, in India. And uh, that was the Hunger Project's first ever partnership on the ground, working with people to end their own hunger. And that, uh, he declared that they would lower the infant mortality rate to 50 within five years, and they did that. Um, and we learned a lot. The other thing that happened uh, that year was uh, that we hired this fellow. Who's he? <laughs> Ambassador Dr. Fidigu Tadessa, who became our, um, who fought his way into the Hunger Project. He, we didn't have a job opening for former uh, African ambassadors to join our staff. Um, and he fought, literally fought his way in. He had been working as an ambassador for a corrupt dictator, so he quit that. And then he was working for a big company that was also corrupt, so he quit that. And a friend of his uh, told him about the Hunger Project and he fought his way in, and thank God that he did. Um, and he uh, became our VP for Africa and was a key component in helping us discover what that missing strategy would be. Next. So um, in 1989, the beginning of the year, we still had no clue, except we had heard from uh, a lot of experts in strategic planning that planning wasn't the solution. Planning was the problem. That these governments were full of top-down planners focusing on these real narrow little top-down projects and those were too inflexible, as the World Bank itself was even saying, to solve the problem of poverty and hunger. So uh, we were invited by the first Africa Prize laureate, President Chief of Senegal, to go and we, we were, um, you know, when you're a guest of a president, they send people to watch after you all the time. So those people at the right-hand side were Ministry of Agriculture people who were kind of our minders. And we said, well, we want to go meet with farmers. So we went to TS and we met with farmers and with those Ministry of Agriculture people there. And there was a big fight. Nobody wanted to talk to us. The farmers actually wanted to talk to those ministry people who they had never met. And the ministry people were kind of interested in talking to farmers because they had never done that. And we thought, huh, well here's something that's missing that we could provide. <laughs> we could get everybody around the table from all different sectors and uh, have them co-create a more holistic bottom-up strategy. And so the next year, next, um, we, we launched what we called Strategic Planning in Action in India. Um, we also that year had our first woman Africa Prize laureate, Esther Oklu. And um, it was a, it was a, a, a fascinating uh, process um, I know Carol was there, I was there. Anybody else at that launching in 1990 in India? It was with um, uh, uh, Ilabat and the Planning Commission and all kinds of experts. And they came up with strategic planning in action. They signed off on it. Uh, next slide. Um, the next year, 1991, 
was a financial crisis year. We were like almost broke. And yet we had committed to launch strategic planning and action in, uh, in Africa. And so we went to Senegal. Um, we were there at doing one of these big meetings at the foreign ministry. We thought, how on earth are we going to pay to launch the Hunger Project in Senegal? So um, we had our next us, investors in the Hunger Project, each promised to pay an additional $20,000 above our whatever our level of giving was to pull together the money that it would take to launch the Hunger Project Senegal. And that uh, was also, next picture, the first investor trip. They went out to the Impal region, uh, which is the area where we were going to start our work. And they uh, experienced it. Um, and uh, it, was, it was magical for everyone participating. It was very inspiring for the Africans, that there were people standing with them in solidarity. It was obviously very inspiring. The first time you're in Africa changes your life forever. And uh, it, it, I remember coming away from that meeting and goes, wow, how, how could we do this for lots of people, <laughs> of our investors, uh, to, um, to get to have this experience? Okay, next slide. Uh, so while we were still broke, um, we, uh, there was the first big environmental conference, actually the second big environmental conference, but the Rio conference. And at the Rio conference, we were, uh, through FIDIGU, FIDIGU lobbied like crazy before that conference to get our tagline that was created in India in as the first principle of the Rio declaration. And uh, this is the line of the first principle of the Rio Declaration, that human beings are at the center of concerns for sustainable development. They are entitled to a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature. And the Hunger Project uh, got that in there. And uh, we were at that point so broke that we couldn't even pay for a staff member to go to that conference. Jerry Davia a volunteer paid his own way. And he was such a good schmoozer, he wound up being invited to stay in the home with um, uh, the Secretary General of the conference and uh, then President Obasanjo of Nigeria. They were like hanging out together. So it's volunteers always make the Hunger Project work. Okay, um, next slide. This is a big turning point year. And uh, at this point, I'd like to invite um, my colleagues uh, from Africa, India, and Bangladesh to come up and take these seats. And if someone could help them put on little mics. Jameer. Jameer, if you could come. and, and Take this seat, Jameer, because you're going to talk first. Come on, Patricia. While they're uh, getting wired up, um, let me just tell you who's up here. Uh, Jameer is uh, a guy I work with very often. He is heads up programs in Bangladesh. Um, Ana Lucia is the advocacy czarina of THP Mexico. Uh, Daisy is the country director of THP Uganda. Patricia heads up one of our big initiatives that we'll hear about a little later in Ghana. And Ganga is the master trainer of trainers in India. Now, a few of these people will have to sit here for quite a while, um, but uh, the first person who I want to talk to, and I've actually written down a question so I wouldn't forget it, is, oh, please have a seat if you can get on your seats. Um, 
so uh, Jameer, are you, are you, can you turn on Jameer's mic? Hello? Yes. So Jameer, uh, the Vision Commitment in Action Workshop uh, was created in Bangladesh and the animator training was created. So can you tell us just in a few minutes how we go about transforming the mindset of people in Bangladesh? Okay, thank you, John. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank everybody. Uh, I am proud uh, to be here uh, with you. Uh, this is my first visit in America uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with a lot of investors and Hunger Project fellows. So uh, I am happy to be here. So Vision Commitment Action Workshop is a, is a, uh, is a tool to mobilize the uh, villagers or our community. Uh, it is uh, basically three hours uh, program. Uh, uh, the vision, uh, uh, vision community action workshop is a uh, process uh, to create a vision of uh, self-reliant community. That means our participants, they uh, uh, find the way uh, what uh, the, what, what they see uh, to reach their community at in a certain time, uh, and um, they explore uh, the vision is doable, and identify their responsibility to make uh, uh, to make it difference, to make them difference. Uh, uh, till to date, uh, uh, we uh, completed 14,000 BCA, BCA workshop, uh, where uh, more than 1 million people participated. And a lot of uh, village, uh, villagers take actions uh, to change their community. At the uh, workshop process, um, we try to change their mindsets of, uh, from dependency, self-centered, uh, and, and they, uh, that, so that they take responsibility to, to be author of their own development. Uh, this, is, uh, 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 this workshop um, launched by the Hangar Project Bangladesh in late 1993. Uh, uh, I think is a effective tool uh, uh, to mobilize community uh, to see, to create their vision, to change their community. Perfect. This is the vision coming in action. That's workshop. great. Great. And, uh, Go ahead. I think. Uh, uh, say animators. Take? Yes. Say yeah. about animators. Animators. So, but. Uh, you know, in our country, um, very few staff, we are working, but a lot of BCAW, uh, work, uh, BCAW workshop uh, conducting, uh, uh, has been conducted in, uh, in our villages. Now who, who, who do the workshop? Our we, call, uh, we create animators. Animators, it is a animator, we have an animator training. It is a tool to create uh, local leaders who feel uh, it, is, uh, it is a four day non residential training program uh, designed to create local volunteers. Uh, who feel uh, uh, who feel to change? Who feel that they have the potential to change their own community, and they take responsibility to change their community through this training process. Uh, they. Uh, we try to uh, 
uh, change their mindsets uh, from dependency, uh, frustrations, and we try to uh, boost up their human spirit, the uh, PSP principles, right. and they take a stand, uh, they commit uh, their commitment, they show their commitment to uh, change their uh, community to end hunger, to uh, reduce uh, gender uh, discrimination. Uh, they take a stand uh, uh, to promote social harmony, social cohesion, and they try to uh, build trust within the community. The leaders, volunteer leaders, basically uh, uh, take responsibility to mobilize other uh, community peoples. They conduct uh, BCA workshop with the community. Basically, we stop, we do not, uh, uh, we do not do, uh, we do not conduct BCA workshop at community level because we are very few staff. But our lot of volunteers, is, um, yeah, uh, to date, uh, we have 160,000 volunteers across Bangladesh. They are working to change their own development. They are working uh, for change their community. Great. Thanks, Junior. Okay. Um, Rami, uh, go to the next slide and leave the slides on. I'm going to go through a few slides before you go back to the camera. So, no sooner had that happened than Mandela happened. Talk about a big, high-profile event when you have uh, the President of the United States, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, the, uh, with President Mandela in Washington, uh, Queen Noor, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the Minister, of, uh, the Secretary of Commerce, and a leading parliamentarian from Japan on our dais. That was quite, quite an event. And uh, how many here were at that event? Oh, wow. So if you remember, President Mandela was uh, very gracious, very nice, and he was very challenging. He said, okay, this is fine. You've got that Senegal thing. He was way more polite than I am. But he said, you've got to expand. You've got, and you know, we were just, just pulling out of this financial crisis. We were beginning to be able to do something new. And um, so, but he challenged us to expand into more African countries. Next. So, uh, and then 95 happened and Beijing happened. And a, a whole delegation of Hunger Project people were at the Beijing conference. Who here was at the Beijing Women's Conference? Anyone? Beijing. Yes, Ganga. Ganga was there. So uh, Joan Holmes was there. And uh, if you'll remember, that was also at a time when there was a horrible, brutal warfare going on in, uh, in, in Bosnia. And meeting women who had been the victims of rape as a tool of war. Uh, it was just a very powerful experience for Joan and our delegation. And uh, sh she called us and we gathered at the global office around the speakerphone and she let us know, I don't know how, but everything is going to change in the Hunger Project after Beijing. Uh, next. So, to follow up on the challenge from Nelson Mandela, um, Joan and Fidigu went to a bunch of countries to figure out where to plant the next hunger project. And uh, they met with President Jerry Rawlings um, under that tree, and he begged them to please uh, have it be Ghana. And so that was our second country. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, then the very next year, we went into Burkina Faso and Benin, and we finally coalesced our evolving program and called it an epicenter strategy. At that time, uh, uh, a government person visited one, 
and he was with Fidigu, and he said, oh, boy, this is a nice community center you've got here. And he went, no, this is not a community center. This is the epicenter of a revolution of mobilization of the community. <laughs> so that was uh, how it got to be named the epicenter. Uh, there's also, and you can watch it on YouTube, uh, Joan did a wonderful meeting with investors in which she really went through the principles of the Hunger Project that had evolved from what we had learned during this second era of the Hunger Project. We call it the pink video because the whole aura of the thing is sort of pink. Is that how you find it on YouTube? Um, it, you find it on YouTube now. You just uh, uh, look for Joan Holmes, 1996. Okay, um, so we're about to uh, launch into the second, third era, but before we do, let's see, I think I had something for us to do. Uh, okay, so you hear Jameer talk about what it takes in Bangladesh to unleash the human spirit, so to transform someone's mindset. So I'd like you to get a partner again and just share with that person an example from your own life of facilitating the unleashing of someone's human spirit. Some interaction you had where a person saw things in a new way, realized that they could do, move from cynicism or resignation to possibility. Just everyone find someone and have that conversation. I was supposed to talk, but me, my question was for me, animators or the answer is there. I don't know whether I'm going to get a different question. John, hmm? I do finger exercise, help with prayer. Okay, yeah, she's here then. Yes. On duty, ma'am. Apne uh, bulaat, huh? Sab, sab log bhiyan ke bhi sweet dikhe hai Gangaji. Oh. We'll do what's next. So um, here we are. At, we've, we've covered 20 years in uh, a little over an hour. And uh, we've, 20 years and we've used up half our time. We're doing good so far. Uh, so, uh, but at, by 1997, we knew that we had epicenters. Um, and um, they were uh, really beginning to happen. I wanted to, if, uh, if we could, uh, move the camera, turn to Daisy, and uh, I'd like Daisy to talk about animators, because in the epicenter context, uh, the epicenter animators um, adopted the VCA workshop um, around the same time, and they, the animators, those began specializing. So I wanted Daisy to talk with us a little bit 
uh, about what it means to be a specialized animator working on a specific topic. What kind of topics do the animators and the epicenters work on? Wow, thank you, John. Uh, good morning, everybody. Or is it still good morning? Still morning. <laughs> yes, so the epicenter strategy had just come in. And uh, from the history we've had, the Hunger Project has been built on volunteership. So this was taking volunteership again to another level, to the people who were actually affected by hunger, the people who were the ones uh, being supported to end their own hunger. And to be part of that process, they were also doing the volunteering themselves. And that is something which uh, we still do up to now. So we have this epicenter strategy where we have communities, members, who are coming up and saying, okay, out of the VCA workshop, some people have some things they are maybe more interested in, or they have some more skills. Uh, if, for example, we have somebody who's been a trained a teacher, then you can, they are comfortable with the training, they are comfortable with more education, with some literacy classes. If we have somebody who has trained in, a, maybe has been in agriculture, or has been planting, then they are more comfortable continuing with uh, agriculture. So we have, according to the holistic nature of the center strategy, we have these, all these sectors, and we have people who are volunteering within each of the sectors. They get a little bit more training, we call it the training of trainers, so they can get the skills in terms of how they can pass on the message, how they can get the people together, and how they can continue motivating to be able to create a movement. So we have animators in each of the areas, each of the programs we work in. We have animators in women empowerment. People, women who are passionate about women empowerment, even men, they say now, women empowerment is the issue I would really want people to talk about, to know about. I would want to get more people involved in women empowerment. And with some little support, then they can go mobilize their community members within their areas to talk about it and how to get other people to be also involved. The same goes with agriculture. We have animators in agriculture, animators in gender, animators in functional adult literacy. In practically all the sectors, we have various animators who are passionate about that particular topic and they want to take the message to the rest of their community members. Awesome, perfect. Um, thank you. Next slide, Rami. So um, the other thing that happened in 1997 is that Avio Perez de Cuellar, the, form, the former Secretary General, said, um, probably a little more politely than this, if you guys don't have programs in Latin America, you're not global, and they're not gonna let me back into Peru when I get off the airplane. <laughs> so we launched, uh, we revitalized the Hunger Project Mexico and launched the Hunger Project's work in Peru and in Bolivia. So I'd like to uh, turn to Ana Lucia, who will tell us about uh, kind of the special challenges of the work of the Hunger Project Mexico. Well, good morning, buenos dias. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, yes, when we started to, uh, the Hunger Project we, in Mexico, we hear a lot about the other strategies around the region, and we started to kind of think a lot about why working in Mexico is so unique or different. <laughs> and I think one of the things is, as you, many of you know, Mexico is one of the top 20 economies in the world. So it is one of the wealthier economies. But half of the people live in poverty. So it's not an issue just of poverty, but it's an issue of inequality. And now we've started to see that over, over half of the people in the whole world that are poor, that ha are live in poverty, are actually in countries like Mexico, like India. And that is posing new challenges for us. No? And in Mexico particularly, if the half of the people live in poverty, like where are the people? They're in rural communities, 
they're in indigenous communities, they're in isolated villages. So how do we get to work on development when communities are around 100 people and you have to drive for 10 hours to work in partnership with them? So it's a different way of approaching development. And so one of the biggest challenges is getting there, no? Uh, for us, some of the regions where we work, are 10 hours away, and then you get to like the municipio, the headquarters of the, of, the, of the region, and then you drive another hour, and then we walk for five hours, no, uphill. And for the people that are from there, they do it in half an hour on an hour, and then for people like me, like, we're like walking up and trying to get there in five hours. So one of the biggest challenges is the isolation. Um, and for us, we've realized in the Hunger Project Mexico that we might not be able to reach millions of people because of the way that the geographical location is, but that no matter, even if it's 100 people in that community, they're people. It's not about numbers. It's about people. It's about ensuring that people are not being left behind. If development is occurring and countries are becoming middle income, how do we ensure that that half of the population is not being left behind? That in Mexico, when the government said 10 years ago, there's no hunger in Mexico, we're like, of course there is. It's just being invisible. So how do we visualize it and try to promote solutions? And so what we've done at the Hunger Project in Mexico is pick small communities, pick sm like work with small regions and scale up. We try to see them as models of community-led development and gender-focused development. We try to show the government how important it is to invest in people and their rights and the change of mindset. Because one of the other big challenges in Mexico, it's like we've seen that throughout the, the, the history, is that it's a very top-down approach. We meet with government officials who have the latest solution to malnutrition or the latest solution to water harvesting. And it's always a very top-down approach. And we're trying to talk to them and be like, no, listen to the people, listen to the communities themselves. They're the ones that know the solutions. They're the ones that we have to work in partnership with them. And another big challenge in Mexico, like in most of Latin America, is politics. Because one time a colleague from another organization said that poverty is actually the biggest wealth for politicians. Because you can buy a vote. If you give them a stove, if you give them a house, if you give them a family garden and you hand it out in a top-down approach, what you're doing is you're getting a vote. So it's about challenging political systems, it's about challenging social norms, and now we have regions like the Mazatec region where communities, for the last five years, we've worked with them, and they changed their mindset. And I did not understand what that meant until I went and saw them, and I met them probably six months into my work. And seeing them be so empowered, so committed to their vision, so organized, I was just completely blown away because it wasn't about the things that we saw. It wasn't about the water harvesting systems. It wasn't about the family gardens. It was about who they had become. And I am so proud to be a part of this project because it's really doing something different. Uh, it's becoming a model and we, I just went to a meeting two weeks ago to see a hundred of them in the, in the region. And I was wondering, I was like, how do 100 people can make a change if there are 50 million people in poverty in Mexico? That was the question. And I was like, they can definitely make a change because if they know their rights, if they're aware, if they're becoming models for the entire region and they're speaking out to their governments, we can definitely see a different Mexico. Woohoo! Okay, uh, <coughs> next slide, Ronnie. There's a few other slides of Mexico here. Let's just step through them. Some, some of these awesome women. Next. And Go you ahead. can see that you actually have to hike up there, and it's yeah. quite difficult to get yeah. <laughs> Next. There's an awesome team. And next. Another awesome, empowered people. OK. so. This era, this era of, of addressing gender inequality wasn't 
a fundamental, we didn't stop doing what we were doing. Because in all of these different regions, all of our programs had really become naturally women focused. They were focusing on improving the lives of women as key to improving the lives of everyone. But we realized that they weren't transforming the underlying discrimination against women and girls that was the root cause of hunger. And that was a big discovery that launched this new era. Next. So um, in 1998, with us, we realized that us investors needed to kind of get this into our hearts and souls first if we were going to fund transformative work for uh, ending discrimination against women. We uh, organized a women's trip to India. We, uh, we really started uh, with our investors to be sure that everyone was on board. Um, next slide. Uh, then uh, in the 1999, uh, after consultations with women leaders from all over Africa, we launched the African Woman Food Farmer Initiative, which was uh, an initiative to really put the spotlight on women food farmers, give them voice, and empower them financially, establish a program of credit, training, and advocacy. And we had torch events where uh, one woman, and this is uh, Ms. Agbila, Nagbila Aseta from Burkina Faso, she came to New York, she received the Africa Prize statue, she took it back home, this is her meeting with the president of Burkina Faso, and then every quarter or so, she would carry it and pass it off to a sister woman farmer in another country, and this went on for a couple of years. And they were parades and motorcycles. Um, anyone here have a short experiential share of being on torch events? Anyone? Yes, back there. Microphone right there. Oh, we have to take one of these? Yeah, yeah we, uh, well, we have sufficient. We have sufficient. Um, this is not about the torch event specifically, but it is about the African woman food farmers. Um, we had, an, uh, my name is Dorothy Stingley. Um, we had an occasion a number of years ago to be in Mozambique, and I had heard about the African women food farmers for years. And we had done some visiting and had an experience of them. And we had also heard about their uh, training over the radio in Mozambique. And then we get to the radio station and we're touring the station. And then we come out the back door and under tents were thousands of women food farmers. And somehow we realized that all week while we had been in Mozambique, they had been feeding us. And then it, somehow it began to fall together that the women have been feeding Africa yep. for centuries. And it, it was so moving to be with them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Right behind you. Um, I had the honor and the privilege of actually being in that room when that was taking place. And um, the ex I'm Yasmin Goodman. And the extraordinary thing about that moment is when the Prime Minister actually spoke to her in Moray, which is her native language. Um, and we didn't understand what that meant, that Dr. Tedessa kind of began to translate what that meant. But the other thing that was, um, I, you know, I just want to say to my Hunger Project family, I, this is so lovely to be here, is, you know, um, when we were here at the Africa Prize Award, 
where she took the award and we got to step off the plane with her. And it was in that moment when you saw the people uh, at the airport just watching our delegation of people from around the world stepping with her off the plane and going to visit her in her village in Burkina Faso, not to the government organizations. The government organizations were really like, why aren't you visiting us? <laughs> um, but we were visiting her and traveling with her. And I had that profound opportunity to know that I made a difference with my life. You know, to be part of the, the footage of watching her step off the plane with a delegation of international investors. Yeah. So that's what I want to say about that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Once again, we were able to seed the epicenters with our f the first million dollars seed money for their uh, credit programs because people had invested $100,000 per family in this initiative to make it possible. Uh, next, the next year was the South Asia Initiative. There's some people we recognize up there. Uh, and uh, this uh, was for both India and Bangladesh, slightly different in each context. But uh, in many, many, many meetings that the Women's Initiative had done, that Joan had led in India, it became very clear that the highest leverage action for transforming gender relations in India would be to train the women who have been elected to the local councils under the new 73rd Amendment of the Indian Constitution that these women for the first time would be, have power in a public political space. And yet, after meeting many of these women, it was clear that a lot of them were not gonna open their mouths. They'd been conditioned for centuries to keep their mouths shut or to only do what their father wanted them to do or their husband wanted them to do. Uh, and some of them were natural leaders and they would start to step out and then their term would be up. So we needed to accelerate that and unleash the leadership of these women. And, uh, and who does it better than anyone I've ever seen is Ganga, uh, our master trainer. And Supriya's gonna interact with her. But the question is, most of the women, Ganga, are non-literate. And so I had the privilege of witnessing the special skills you have to develop leadership among women who are non-literate. So if you could tell us about that and demonstrate how you do it. Friends, I use mixed language, Hindi and English. So Supriya helped me. Huh? In India, we are working elected women representative at village council. We name Gram Panchayas. This time, we are working 8,000 elected women representative from 1,900 gram panchayat at six states. Our EWR's elected women representative, EWR. EWR's mostly illiterate. 48% EWRs are illiterate. So, big challenge for us as a trainer. What can we do in training to joyful learning, to participatory learning? So we use song, drawing, exercise, group exercise, case studies, stories, extra. So I show you one exercise. Supriya, please help me. Jab mailai aati hai training mein, to wo apne aap ko ek maa, ek beti aur ek behen ke roop mein paati hai. वो अपने आप को एक पॉलिटिकल लीडर या पॉलिटिकल सिटीजन के रूप में रिकॉग्नाइज नहीं करती है 
So when the, the rural women, um, the elected women representatives come to um, the workshop, they walk into the room in the, the roles that have been assigned to them by society as a daughter, as a mother, as a mother-in-law, as um, uh, you know, a daughter-in-law. Um, and they do not see themselves as politically elected women who have an accountability. Right? Yes. India me Mailang ko home based role me rakha gaya tha. So, wo apne aap ko leader ke roop me thoda deer se samajne ko kosis karti hai. Kyuki patriarchal system maha pe hai. Or unko inside the home rakha gaya hai. Iski vaje se ye problem aata hai. So, हम लोग पहले ये कोशिश करते हैं कि वो माँ बहन बेटी से ऊपर उठकर खुद को सिटीजेंस के रूप में रिकॉग्नाइज करें। This is big challenge for us कि वो अपने आप को इंडियन सिटीजन के रूप में रिकॉग्नाइज करें। Because India is really a part of the patriarchal system. And it's really ingrained in our uh, genes. Um, it's very difficult for the women, even though they get elected to office and it's a significant position, to actually step out of the gender specified roles and find themselves located as a citizen of a country or even a representative on behalf of the people in their communities. And the work that Gangaji and others like her do becomes even harder to explain to them that they need to set that aside in order to step into and discover who they can be as the leaders on behalf of the people they're serving. So, we start karte hain. Pahle wo apne aap ko citizens ke roop mein mahsus kare. और लीडर तो वो बन गई है पॉलिटिकल लीडर तो वो बन गई है तो वो सिटीजेंस के बाद अपने आप को एक लीडर के रूप में महसूस करे तो मैं आपको बताने चाहती हूँ एक एक्सरसाइज के माध्यम से कि हम उनको अपना सिटीजनशिप कैसे महसूस कराते हैं सो बीइंग इलेक्टेड गिव्स वन अ लेबल ऑफ अ लीडर but one doesn't discover what that means until they have to actually take actions and lead. And in being understanding that leadership role, understanding their role as a citizen that, has, that one gets at birth. When you're born into a country, you become a citizen of that country. And that self-discovery is what Gangaji is going to show you with an exercise. She might ask you guys to participate, so be careful. <laughs> so, I request you I request to you all, your hand out. Let yes. Me. Anyone. <laughs> Our hand. Okay. This finger, little. Okay? What? So, in what? our society, in our society, in our India, some rich, some poor, some uh, from city, some from village, some from upper caste, some for lower caste. So many religions, so very differences in populations. So our Indian constitution gives us right to equality. So is tarah se ab baat chit karke ki bahut log chote bade hain par Bharatiya Samvidhan kehta hai ki ham sab barabar hain. We are equal. So first our right, right to equality. And that's what's mandated by the Indian constitution that every man, woman, child has equal rights. Down, please. Being down. part of. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's not putting his hand down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 
सेकेंड आपको बहुत बार हाथ अप एंड डाउन करना पड़ेगा बोलो सो लिफ्ट योर हैंड्स अप अगेन गाइस हाँ सेकेंड फिंगर इज मोस्टली वी बी आर रिंग रिंग वेडिंग रिंग एंगेजमेंट रिंग यस 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 वेडिंग एंगेजमेंट कम फ्रॉम रिलीजन सो हम ये सब बता के उनको कहते हैं वी हैव राइट टू चूज आवर ओवन रिलीजन सो आगे आगे एंड सो दिस फिंगर ऑक्यूपाइड दिस 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 हाँ Yeah. No freedom. So, third, our fundamental right is right to freedom. Go away. Go away. <laughs> right to freedom. <laughs> <laughs> And fourth, when you torture me, when you abuse me. I challenge do not this do not this do not this hmm? yes 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 clear so fourth fundamental right is right to re reject exploitation hmm? right to reject exploitation right yes yes this is for right fifth in india in many of country we use our thumb as a illiterate person okay. so we use this right to cultural and education right hmm. we have we all have cultural and education right okay yep so fifth right in our hand society all time patching our right exploitation our right so six and very important right is constitutional remedies right all <laughs> finger come together constitutional remedies right <laughs> right on thank you thank you for that Thank you, John. Guys. Okay, next slide, Rami. So, in 2001, the World AIDS Conference was in New York. Uh, Hunger Project participated, and it was very clear that the gender aspect, male responsibility. for spreading the aids crisis was not being addressed everybody was talking about empowering women to fight aids but it was the uh cultural behavior of men that were fueling the spread of the disease and so um in uh we honored four aids activists including men who were mobilizing men to take responsibility for halting the pandemic next slide and then We had our 25th anniversary. Um it was we had live up feeds from epicenters in Burkina Faso and we had uh all sorts of action and we had in Kampala, Uganda, a big conference to design the HIV AIDS and gender inequality workshop. So that was the newest addition of our transformative arsenal. in uh, our programming next then um we had a big 
Um, we, I forgot to mention we were once again in financial crisis. <laughs> Joan had taken over fundraising to dig us out of that crisis and we devoted the year 2003 to the year of the investor. We had a big event here in New York to really honor investors in the Hunger Project. And, to, uh, and Joan also gave testimony on these gender issues in the US Congress. Next. So um, at, at this point then, uh, the Hunger Project uh, was in, uh, Joan was put on the Hunger Task Force of the uh, UN Millennium Project designed to create the strategies for achieving the Millennium Development Goals. She was the one gender fighter on the Hunger Task Force. She succeeded, she got it in there. We had a big girl-child event. We had the head of the Millennium Project come and visit our epicenters in Ghana. Uh, this was all very exciting. And uh, we kept on strengthening and developing our gender programs. Now, uh, Patricia, who's here with her mic, she leads one of our biggest gender intervention programs in Ghana, um, and I'd like her to tell us about it. Hello, everyone. Are we still in morning or afternoon? <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> then good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> right. The Hunger Project works with our epicenter strategy. And as we have heard from my co-speakers, we still are in the great work that was done by people like you who started whilst I wasn't even born, because I was born in 1985. So when they started giving the history, I said, wow. <laughs> so some of these great people prepared their way whilst I was even in the womb. And this is my time to also contribute to the great work they have already started. So in Ghana, I coordinate the Hair Choice Program, and it's about eradicating child marriage in our communities and in our epicenters. We work with adolescent girls and boys, both in school and out of school. And we educate and sensitize them on the existing laws of child marriage. Ghana frowns on child marriage. Marriage that takes place before the age of 18 is an abuse. It is a crime. But in our rural settings and in rural Ghana, most of the girls don't know, even the parents themselves. So the Hair Choice Program educates community members to be aware of these existing laws and to empower girls and boys, adolescent girls and boys, to take up action against child marriage and against inequality that is going on in the community. We do this through the school system. We formed Head Choice Clubs where we train these adolescent girls and boys to be empowered, to get a voice, to stand up and speak against child marriage. Now, girls and boys are becoming awakened of the fact that they need to stand up and speak for their rights. They are girls, they are not wives. They are boys, they are not husbands. And this is one of our motto. I am a girl, I am not a wife. So when you meet a club member and you ask her choice, then the person will say, it's my choice. Her choice, I am a girl, I am not a wife. So they are able to know that they don't have to be forced into marriage. Being in school is the most priority thing they have to think of. And through the Hair Choice Program, we have been able to mobilize these girls and their families to push them so that they will remain in school. As 
the norm of hunger projects work. We work holistic in the community. And therefore, we also work with community leaders, be it religious leaders, traditional leaders, the chiefs, assembly persons, opinion leaders. The Hair Choice Program also mobilized these leaders and trained them in the existing laws against child marriage. Now, community leaders have been aware that no, child marriage is not part of our tradition. It is a human rights abuse, and it is a crime. In one of my community meetings, I was so surprised to see after a discussion with the community members, and the, most of them were community leaders. One chief stood up and said, indeed, we have really done uh, bad things. That is, I'm translating it local in our language. We have really done bad things to our children. We were thinking that helping them into marriage is the best thing, not knowing we were abusing them. And for me, as a chief, I think we have to stand up against child marriage, and we have to come up with bylaws, even within our community, to fight against child marriage. And it became a discussion. So one of the chief asked, how can we do this? Then he said, I think one of the areas where, or the events, where some of these things start taking place, is during funerals and wakekeeping. Can we enact by laws and by every parent to allowing his or her children to still be at wakekeeping after 6 p.m.? And can we also enact by laws binding people from having wakekeeping and funerals after 6 p.m.? Then all the chiefs said yes. So in that meeting, there wasn't any plan, agenda of enacting bylaws or taking action. But through the education, they got to realize that indeed they have been really doing evil or bad things against their children. Mm. So now they are now awakening, and some of these bylaws are being taken and being enacted throughout the whole epicenter and the, now the 10, eight epicenters that the Hair Choice Program is being run. Hopefully we will scale up to other epicenters after our midterm evaluation 2018. <laughs> so if you want to know what, where the big wave is right now that our surfboard is on, Halting Child Marriage, which is officially recognized as a form of gender-based violence, is at, is at the point of the spear, is at the curl of the wave that we're working on. And it's happening also with the EWRs, the elected women in India now, with a, a very new program. Uh, and I wanted to ask Ganga about the program of the adolescent girls in India. Yes, uh, I need to translate. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. You can do Hindi, it's fine. <laughs> her, her Hindi is university level Hindi. <laughs> Mine is Bollywood Hindi. <laughs> <laughs> Bear with me if I look at Okay. India me hum jo chuni hui jan pratridiyo ke saath me lagbag pichle satra saal se kaam kar rahe hain. Ye जनप्रतिनिधियां जब ट्रेंड हो जाती हैं तो अपने गांव में पानी के लिए फूड के लिए इलेक्ट्रिसिटी के लिए रोड के लिए और जितने भी जरूरतें हैं उनके लिए काम करती है उनके प्रायोरिटी में गरीब लोग ज्यादा रहते हैं सो व्हेन या या when a woman gets elected into a, a village democratic position um, in her village council, the priorities of her community become her priorities. So she becomes an advocate for better clean water, sanitation, 
health, nutrition, um, gender equity. But one of the biggest priorities she has is helping all the people who are vulnerable, whether it's uh, the differently abled communities or even uh, uh, the poorest of the poor. If you think that you've seen the poor people, the poor people see another layer of poor that um, is even harder to believe. Dusra ye ki India mein patriarchal system bahut hai. To jab se bachi pet mein aati hai, tab se uske saath discrimination hota hai. Aur ye chalta hi rehta hai jab tak wo mar na jaye. In India's patriarchal system begins to show its hand the minute a girl child is born and it follows her to the moment that she dies. So, hum log women leader ke saath kaam karte hain jab wo women ban jati hai aur wo jab wo leader ban jati hai aur itne mein 2500 saal nikal jate hain The Hunger Project has begun its work when a woman is in her 20s, mid-30s, when she's elected to become a leader for her community. And the girls and women discrimination cycle is going on and on and on and on and on. So, we thought that कि क्यों हम लड़की के औरत होने का इंतजार करें क्यों ना हम लड़कियों को ही इंपावर करें सो so, हमने अपना ये आइडिया अपने जनप्रतिनिधियों के साथ शेयर किया हम सबको अच्छा लगा और हमने इस आइडिया को अपना नेक्स्ट स्ट्रेटजी बना लिया व्हेन वी लुक टू सी व्हाट कुड वी डू टू ब्रेक द साइकिल दैट इज करेंटली प्रेवलेंट um, which um, is what I said earlier. We, we looked at the possibility of empowering girls who are going to be tomorrow's women and tomorrow's leaders. Tomorrow's citizen. And tomorrow's citizens. Thank you. Um, so we went to the elected women representatives whom we had trained and um, had an interaction with them to see what they thought of that idea. Uh, would they participate in empowering the girls in their communities to become the leaders of tomorrow? To, so that would be their legacy for the future. And they were wholeheartedly accepted it, and the Hunger Project in India has now created a special strategy to work with adolescent girls in partnership with the elected women representatives. <laughs> She says she's not done yet. Okay. So, I like that where you are so far. <laughs> India me ladkiyo ka jo istiti hai, wo baat acha nahi hai. Har dusri ladki mal nirist hai. Atara saal se pehle, aadhi se jada ladkiyo ka saadi ho jata hai. Panchvi tak ki padhai baat kam ladkiyan kar pati hai aur kar pati hai. So middle school, high secondary school and college tak paunchne mein unko bohat bohat dikhte aati hai. The life of a girl child in India is um, pretty dismal. And um, not only, you know, that most often they are aborted before they are born. Um, they do not have an opportunity to go to school beyond the, beyond the fifth grade because in the village communities, most often the school is only up to fifth grade. And if they do desire to go and study further the, to middle school or uh, secondary school or even college, they have to travel long distances to do that and require the permission of their families. Indian ladkiyon ko ghar ke andar रखने की ज्यादा कवायद रहती है ज्यादा रखा जाता है कि वो घर के काम सीखे अपने छोटे भाई बहनों को रखे 
और सबकी सेवा करे और चुप रहे कहीं ना जाए इस तरह के स्थिति में उनको रखा जाता है गंगा जी स्पीकिंग अबाउट गर्ल्स इन विलेज कम्युनिटीज सो एंड दैट्स अ वास्ट पॉपुलेशन इन इंडिया इज इट मोस्ट ऑफन गर्ल्स आर हाउस बाउंड um they have to take care of their younger siblings or even their older siblings um they're treated differently than their brothers and often they are told to be silent be seen and not heard unko apna subject wo kya padhegi ye chunne ka adhikar nahi hai to apna husband chunne ka adhikar to bilkul bhi nahi hai when they don't have the liberty to decide whether they want to go to school and be educated how can they have the liberty to choose their life partner so itni kharab sthiti mein agar hamari aaj ladkiyan hai to kal wo phir waisi hi women banegi to hum logon ne socha कि ये जो ग्राम पंचायत लोकल गवर्नेंस का जो फ्रेमवर्क है और हम लोग इलेक्टेड वुमेन रिप्रेजेंटेटिव के साथ में काम करते हैं तो क्यों ना लड़कियों को शामिल किया जाए इसमें और लड़कियां शामिल हुई हमने उनके साथ में दो अप्रोच लगाए हैं लाइफ स्किल एजुकेशन एंड लीडरशिप ट्रेनिंग so the distinction she makes is um if the lives of the girls continue to be this way then that would be the life of the woman that she would become and in order to intervene into that cycle they decided to take a two pronged strategy one is to create teach them and create life skill learning and she'll speak more to that And the second one is to build their leadership capacity in life skill education mein hum unke self ko empower karte hain aur unke communication skill ko empower karte hain unke decision making ke skill ko empower karte hain unke creative thoughts creative mind ko active karte hain so life skills we probably thought they were going to be given skills to learn tailoring and things like that <laughs> that's not what we are doing we are really working with them to have them understand who they are as human beings as citizens of a country as vibrant partners in making a difference and bringing about change we are having them think creatively communicate actively and share their learnings with other girls ek sabse badi baat jo unko hum ha sikhane ki koshish karte hain wo hai emotional management tension management so ye sab karte hue aur unka leadership empower hote hue आज की वो जो लड़कियाँ जिनके साथ में हम अराउंड सिक्स थाउजेंड गर्ल्स के साथ काम कर रहे हैं वो लड़कियाँ अपने बाल विवाह को रुकवा रही है अपना स्कूल को कंटिन्यू कर रही है जेंडर डिस्क्रिमिनेशन के खिलाफ ये अंगुली यूज कर रही है और वो अपने आप को एक्टिव सिटीजनशिप के रूप में तैयार कर रही है और एक लड़की से अनेक लड़की पियर एजुकेशन वो चीज भी हमने शुरू कर दी है तो दिखने में छह हजार है पर छह हजार मल्टीप्लेयर सो ईच गर्ल इज बीइंग ट्रेन्ड द वे आई जस्ट डिस्क्राइब एंड शी इज आल्सो बीइंग आस्ड टू डू पियर टू पियर एजुकेशन सो यू थिंक सिक्स थाउजेंड गर्ल्स एंड मल्टीप्लाई इट बाय एटलीस्ट ट्वेंटी और थर्टी गर्ल्स per um you know the ripple effect of our work is great now i'm going to La- ask ganga ji last to- last one line okay. <laughs> that's why she's a trainer <laughs> uh elected women representative 
उनका हैंड होल्ड करके चली है क्योंकि वो जानती है कि मेरी ग्राम पंचायत में बहुत सारे योजनाएं हैं बहुत सारे स्कीम्स हैं जिनकी मदद से मैं इनको आगे ले जा सकती हूँ वो केवल उनके पानी की या उनके स्वास्थ्य की बात भी करती है लेकिन उनके कॉलेज के लिए एडवोकेसी कर रही है उनके लिए एक स्पेस बना रही है जो जहाँ वो बैठ के बात कर सके तो ये सब इसलिए हो रहा है क्योंकि वो सोचती है कि टूडेज गर्ल टुमारोज एक्टिव सिटीजन So basically, um, the elected women representatives are holding hands with the uh, the girls, adolescent girls in their communities, so that they can advocate for resources from the government, so that these girls can pursue uh, a higher education, can create a space of um, leadership and learning for themselves, and therefore, not just advocating for you know the the basic needs like water and sanitation. But really looking at it into the future of how to have a, a better colleges, buses. Yep. You'll hear more from her tonight <laughs> and tomorrow night. And Ganga Ji is going to speak to you all in English herself tonight. So that's a, something worth coming to. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So. Um, we're really, with all these initiatives, we're kind of at the end of this, this third era. So I want you to turn again to a partner, and I want you to share with each other sort of one of the pivotal moments in your own awakening to the issue of gender discrimination as fundamental to human progress. To holding back human progress. one. A lot of lights. Okay, please wrap it up. And please turn on my mics if they're not on. Good. Okay, everybody. So we're now going to uh, complete that phase, and we're going to move into the phase that we are in now and into the future. So um, 
uh, Rami, we're going to move fairly directly through some slides, and we can stay on the slides for a few minutes. So the MDG Review Summit in 2005 came out very strongly with this conclusion that we have slapped into many, many proposals. That the greatest technical back <laughs> greatest technical challenge lies not in identifying the right interventions or making them work in one village, but in taking known interventions to scale. Woohoo! Next slide. So we ran with that. We declared without the funding that we would do that in at least one country, demonstrate that our strategy could go to scale. And uh, the Robertson Foundation, represented by the guy in the white hair at the right, uh, Bill Cotter, uh, funded us a challenge match uh, that many people joined to uh, demonstrate that instead of just cherry picking the most ready communities that we could randomly select communities, we could mobilize them. We learned a whole lot about what it would take to really make our strategy a true policy alternative in Africa. Next. So now that's where we're at now. How do we get this to everyone? How do we transform the policies, the budgets, the ways of being of the people who make those policies and budgets such that we can get gender-focused, community-led development to everyone? Next. We were hit. Uh, the wave shifted, and every one of these horrendous shifts also presents an opportunity, uh, by the food price crisis and uh, by Joan's retirement. Joan retired in the end of 2007, beginning of 2008. Um, Jill became our new, our, our second uh, president of the Hunger Project. Um, she brought with her a wealth of knowledge about monitoring and evaluation, which came in really handy when we started fighting policymakers. But you can see there in 2008 and 9, there was a huge spike in prices. There was no shortage of food. There was just a huge spike in prices caused by many factors, including speculation. Next slide. That, le that caused policymakers, and we helped them see this fact, that the budgets and the aid, and in this case the World Bank allocations, to farmers, to agriculture, had been going down for decades, 30 years of decline. Uh, back in the African famine, 1984, they all promised that they would go up. Instead, ever since then, they had gone down. So no big surprise that there was a food price crisis. Uh, that led to uh, the discovery of the critical role of gender in nutrition by policymakers. And they launched the Thousand Day Initiative and the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement that focuses on women's nutrition from that period at the beginning of her pregnancy through her child's second birthday. If she's not well nourished during that period, that child has way less opportunity in their entire life, may, way more likelihood. So the Hunger Project integrated Thousand Day Nutrition into all of our programs. This is one of the slide books from uh, the, the Bangladesh Thousand Day Training Workshop that our women leaders there lead. Next, um, we concocted a new mission statement to define our role in this era. Our mission is to end hunger and poverty by pioneering sustainable grassroots women-centered strategies and advocating for their widespread adoption in countries throughout the world. And our third president, Mary Ellen McNish, uh, championed our ability to do that and to come together as one global family aligned with that mission. Um, our new president that you'll hear tonight, Suzanne Frint, manages us about every five minutes based on that mission statement. Okay, is it pioneering those kind of strategies and is it advocating for their widespread adoption? That's what we do. Next. So our, um, with those commitments by policymakers, starting at the G7, all of a sudden the Hunger Project, which had knocked on policymakers' doors for years and been thoroughly ignored, all of a sudden we were having lunch at the cool kids' table. We were invited to meetings all the time. 
in all different countries, in all different places. We were, because the programs that we have, even though we're not at all the biggest NGO, our, our space with food farmers is immense. And our policy inputs have been very, very welcome. So we started, um, I was a delegate to the Commission on the Status of Women. Lorena started representing the Hunger Project and larger civil society at the G20 summits. Uh, Pascal led a nationwide uh, nutrition campaign in Benin. We did a whole World Bank study on good governance uh, in Bangladesh. Next. Um, and that takes us to the run up to the post 2015 agenda. The Millennium Development Goals expired in 2015. They were designed to get us halfway to the end of hunger. Some very exciting things happened after 2010. Africa, which had lagged behind in progress, all of a sudden was leading in progress. And uh, the last five years of the Millennium Development Goals were looking very, very good. Countries were making way better progress than anyone expected. And the World Bank did this projection that showed, wow, you could get to a statistical zero in extreme poverty by the year 2030. Sure enough. Next. So we um, are one, two, three, fourth. President Osa took over. And we, she, she was asked by the board to really conduct a strategic planning process of what this would take. And by this point, we were starting to get grants and support from uh, not just from us, but also from foundations and governments for sectoral projects, that same kind of top-down narrow projects. We could find a little money for one, the other, but uh, do one mouse click. But what we noticed was that big blue circle, the heart of our work, the transformation of mindsets, mobilizing communities, developing leadership, improving local governance, that wasn't something donors wanted to fund. One more click. And then some wonderful scholars said, oh, that stuff, that's called gender-focused community-led development. And we were able to raise a banner and actually name the distinction of the heart of our work in a way that policymakers could understand. I watched OSA at the UN. They would say, well, what do you do in the Hunger Project? She'd say, we do gender-focused community-led development. They go, oh, really? <laughs> it, it has made a huge difference in our ability to have policy influence. Next. So we decided to get together with other groups to form the Movement for Community-Led Development, and we launched it on the launching day of the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. And OSA was seated right next to the CEO of Unilever and the Gateses, and we thought, yes, that's the kind of positioning we want for gender-focused community-led development. So uh, next. Uh, the other thing that was happening, and this has also been very exciting for policymakers, is that we had to, for the previous five years, Daisy and Samuel and others had really been rethinking the epicenter strategy, confronting what would it really take to have sustainable self-reliance in the epicenters. They came up with eight goals, 52 indicators, a scorecard that was hard to reach, very uh, household evaluations that showed that this was really reaching the people it needed to reach. And so in 2016, if you were here at last year's event, we were really celebrating the first epicenters to achieve all of these goals and to declare their self-reliance. So uh, this is key, it's at the heart of our strategy, but now we have proof that it's happening. Uh, next. So with uh, the passage of the Sustainable Development Goals and the, and the raising this distinction of our work, we started finding more allies, like the United Nations Development Program. They have global conferences on community-led development. Who knew? And they started flying me to those conferences and helping us reach out to more governments. Um, next slide. 
So this is our future. And we're going to spend the rest of our 10 minutes that we have together on putting the toe in the water of our future because one thing is clear, you are critical to our future. Us, we, the committed, the people at every level, the volunteers, the animators, all of us in solidarity still are pushing this rock up the hill. Now, the good news is it's happened successfully in a few countries. Yes. Countries like Korea, Philippines, Indonesia have taken community-led development to full scale. So we can tell countries about that. Uh, next slide. We identify that our highest leverage role in this era would be to build the large-scale partnerships and alliances to empower gender-focused community-led rural development everywhere that it's needed. Next slide. So here are some places where it's needed. This is the list of the countries in the world where there are more than 10 million hungry people. And four of them we have hunger projects in. But here's the cool thing. The movement for community-led development, which the Hunger Project is leading, has emerging chapters of our movement of people committed to, and to empowering women and men everywhere to take charge of their own future in 12 of those 13 countries. We don't have anybody in Sudan yet, we're working on it. So the, the policies and programs and approaches and methodologies that the Hunger Project wants to share, we're starting to have champions um, and partners and allies. Next slide. This is the members of the US chapter of the Movement for Community-Led Development. And we have growing chapters in uh, many, many, many countries uh, and declared in quite a few countries. Uganda just launched, uh, Mexico recently launched. And so uh, we are not just doing pi the pioneering work, we're doing the advocacy for widespread adoption in a very, very strategic way all over the Hunger Project and with like-minded organizations around the world. Wow. wow. <laughs> so, next slide. The SDGs aren't just the MDGs. They build on the MDGs and they awaken us to a few problems that we weren't included in the MDGs, like community resilience to shocks, like uh, engagement of youth. There's a huge youth bulge in the population that's largely unemployed. Building peace. And uh, so if I can have the next slide. So one of the exciting new parts of the future is getting a lot of attention is that data has shown that the work we do in Bangladesh prevents violence. Bangladesh can be a very violent place and we have now evidence and proof that's attracted a lot of attention. Um, and uh, if you could just maybe for one or two minutes talk about the way, Jameer, that the Hunger Project in Bangladesh is um, building peace ambassadors and peace pressure groups. Thank you. Uh, basically, uh, you know Bangladesh is a peace-loving uh, country, interpret uh, harmony, and uh, their coexistence was uh, our traditions. Yeah. But in few uh, last few years, uh, religious-based radicalization and violent, uh, ex violent extremism has been growing across the country uh, to prevent, uh, but our government uh, a strategy uh, to stop this uh, extremism through policy action. But it is, uh, we realize that it uh, cannot be solved to, uh, to by uh, only police action. It needs to social uh, mobilization to create a movement against uh, radicalization and bio, uh, uh, extreme, uh, bi violent extremism, by uh, extreme thought. 
सो हंगर प्रोजेक्ट 2015 वो ये डिजाइन प्रोजेक्ट एंड इंप्लीमेंटेड विद द सपोर्ट ऑफ आईपीएस फंडेड बाय यूके यूके एट एंड यूएस एट दिस प्रोग्राम इस कॉल्ड ऑलरेडी यू सीन दैट pay people against violence in election um, this project is uh, um, implemented after the national election of uh, 2000 in 2014 uh, you know uh, in uh, around uh, national election uh, there are uh, there are happening lot of violence many people are killed in our country in and and in this context we implement pay uh, through the pay uh, we uh, we engage political leaders both awmili uh, uh, both political awmili uh, and pp opponent uh, who uh, uh, does not um, relate with each other and they think that he, uh, each other as enemy as enemy okay uh, in this context we arrange training uh, at sub national level and we uh, engage uh, awmili leader and bmp leaders and other civil society society leaders in a uh, three days training uh, the training was residential but uh, through uh, training process uh, their mindset has changed and they uh, they had good relation each other and they uh, they uh, they has uh, committed uh, to um, to peace uh, to establish peace in their community uh, to, uh, and we uh, we create uh, um, uh, till now um, uh, 1000 peace uh, leaders uh, out of uh, 1000 we create uh, peace ambassadors um uh, 150 peace ambassadors who are the leaders who um, organize other uh, 20 peoples and community they uh, arrange a different type of peace events uh, to our community people against, uh, against uh, radicalization and violent thoughts awesome and perfect uh, our different donors are like it and they uh, they are interested to invest in this project Great. Woo-hoo. Next slide. So, uh, community resilience, that is the ability to absorb a shock and come back stronger, is uh, really being put to the test right now in Mexico, as you've seen in the news. And so, Ana Lucia, tell us about what's happening. Oh, the mic, sorry. Thank you, Trish. Well, um, it was a month ago that we had several earthquakes in Mexico um, that shook up a lot also the staff. It was, it, it was a difficult month last month. Uh, it ended up being that the regions that were most affected by the earthquakes, uh, because we have earthquakes almost every month, <laughs> but these earthquakes were major earthquakes in the country, uh, affected the regions that were normally the poorest regions and the indigenous communities. And And what we started to see is we had just actually launched the movement for community-led development a month before the earthquakes. And we were starting to try to figure out like how do we, how do we scale up? How do we involve, it's, ensure that it's not only the hunger projects model and vision of the world, but it's shared by multiple organizations. When we started talking about community-led development, organizations automatically thought, that's what we do. And they signed up, and we signed up, and we have around 25 organizations that just didn't know how to call the how we do development. They called, we do water, we do nutrition, but the how, the engagement of people, the mobilization, the empowerment had been key. So in the last month since the earthquake, we started to reach out to organizations. Lorena, our country director, who's a leader in civil society, was able to involve around 80 organizations that are working on this project. It was called Epicentro, Epicenter. Uh, we didn't come up with the name, but it naturally was aligned with our vision. And we're promoting now community-led reconstruction. 
if millions are going to come into Mexico, if civil, even, or even people that normally don't invest in development are investing by millions in the country, how do we ensure that the reconstruction leads is led by the communities themselves? That it's not a reconstruction of, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm nice, I live in Mexico City, I want to contribute, I'm going to come and build houses the way that I want them to be, but to actually listen and pause to communities themselves. And we have, we're reaching out about five points. One, that it has to be led by communities. It has to have a human rights approach. That the reconstruction has to be led by women and have a gender focus. It cannot create more inequalities. It cannot create more housework, more burden, more challenges for the women. Uh, and that it has to be multicultural. A reconstruction in one region is not the same than reconstruction in another place with a different culture. So we're advocating for that and we've been quite active. And it's been a lesson also for, for us at the Hunger Project because disasters are happening around the world, natural disasters, it's going to be increasing. And now we, when we started to think what is our highest leverage role, what is missing in the conversations, it's community-led development. Awesome. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, UNDP has, uh, you, you have a mic, okay, good news. So UNDP and the local government ministry in lots of countries are now really interested in working with us. And I wanted to ask Daisy to just quickly tell us the latest breakthrough in Uganda. Okay, thank you. So we have been struggling with this uh, scaling up our hip center strategy. Uh, we started over 10 years ago trying to uh, talk with our government on how they can actually adopt our strategy and implement it and it becomes part of the government strategy for ending hunger and poverty. Uh, in the, uh, about 10 years ago, our government had put it in the National Development Plan but eventually they didn't know how to and it was never funded, so we were sort of disappointed. But we kept on and we kept talking. And with the advent of the SDGs, uh, sort of we went back to the table and said, now, here is an opportunity, and uh, you have signed to this UN commitment, so how do we go about it? Uh, this was something uh, which even uh, they, they had the support of UNDP. So we went back to our ministry, and this time we, ha we had started with the office of the president, we went to the Minister of Agriculture, went to Minister of Gender, eventually we realized now we have the Minister of Local Government, which sort of works with almost all the local communities. And when we went there, we discussed with the ministry, uh, they were also discussing with uh, the UNDP office in Uganda, and eventually we came together as three in, a, in a partnership, the three entities. And uh, we, in the discussions, we realized the ministry had sort of uh, started on a community development, community, a, a, a more project-based uh, development initiatives. And when we explained our methodology of community-led development, they were saying, okay, this could be a little bit better, or it could add on what we are actually doing. Uh, they sent a team, a delegation, to visit some of our EPS centers uh, to learn, to ask. They talked to our animators, they talked to our EPS center leadership, they talked to us, they talked to the local governments. And eventually they were convinced that actually this epicenter strategy works. And uh, as of for this year, we are piloting together with the ministry and UNDP, we are piloting one epicenter in one of the, uh, the districts in northern Uganda, and we have two in the pipeline. So we believe that once, government, once that piloting phase actually becomes successful, and we believe it, is, it will be, because it is on track, communities have been mobilized, construction has already started, people are contributing materials, uh, the local government is also really uh, very happy, and uh, we feel that with that epicenter, we'll be able to scale up and go to the other two epicenters as pilot, and then we'll be able to go beyond. 
Uh, about um, a month ago, actually John was in Uganda, we held one of the, uh, uh, an international conference on community LA development, and we are also showcasing our epicenter strategy and our partnership, and we believe that uh, going forward, this is one of the ways in which we are seeing uh, the scale up really going very well. Yay! Next slide. So the, the last big challenge uh, is uh, youth, and I want to introduce the leader of the Hunger Project's Youth Engagement Task Force, and, a, and the first person in the Hunger Project ever to mount that podium at the big room of the United Nations, Mary Kay Costello. So you have to point this at your mouth. Is it, are we on? Can you hear me all? Okay. So when I started with The Hunger Project a few years ago, I had come from a background of designing and implementing youth leadership skill development programs in Northwest Africa. And I'm learning about all the nuances of The Hunger Project, and of course, and rightfully so, we talk about how women are half of the population. Uh, but youth make up half of the population too. And John said, how often are you gonna bring up the youth thing? I'm like, every day, yes. <laughs> until it becomes like one of our top priorities. And now it has, fast forward to where we stand today, moving in, into our strategic plan through 2020 and beyond, uh, youth engagement in our programs and scaling that up even beyond what we have in existence now is at the forefront of one of the more responsible and uh, relevant things the Hunger Project can do and keeping the youth engaged in our work. So I have um, been working with Anna as my co-lead in the Youth Engagement Task Force and about eight or so other program and partner country staff to be looking at what this so-called overhaul of our programs would look like in having this very dedicated, strategic, intentional inclusion of youth engagement and leadership skill development. Um, unemployment among youth is of course a vast issue, but we want to be very meaningful about how we're looking at issues of unemployment and inclusion in society for youth. What are youth interests? What are their goals? How can we make what they're interested in doing for their future not just an employment opportunity, but also confidence building and making sure that maybe they're not only working in agriculture, but getting involved in other trades. For example, the stress was made by a male Ghanaian youth um, in the field in the central region as well. So thanks to the awesome work that we are seeing in Her Choice and in India and across Bangladesh and uh, other youth pockets of, of development work that we're doing, we really now are in a place where we have strong results and numbers where our work currently is showing strong results around youth leadership and engagement. But as John mentioned, we're taking the leadership role in the advocacy space around this as well. The Hunger Project has been a huge leader in standing with um, the Youth and Gender Equality Working Group of the United Nations, the major group for children and youth, um, the SDG's policy and strategy group with the youth as well, and a, a vast number of others, helping draft and finalize youth declarations that are passed on to the Commission on the Status of Women, uh, standing at podiums like this, um, and essentially leading the force behind what youth globally need and want to do, and what that means, especially in this world of globalized technological communication. The standards are changing. What youth see is different. So yeah, I'm very excited about this. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, um, and excited to see what this all looks like. Hopefully it won't be me speaking here. It'll be a youth from one of our programs speaking about this in years to come, so. Great. Okay. So um, this is our future. Um, it still, as always, it's you and I, investors in the Hunger Project, who make this possible. And uh, we are, we have, together in our common humanity with the world, seen hunger reduced from killing 30,000 children a day to now less than 8,200. Um, and that's still not enough. We need to finish the job. Uh, we believe we're strategically poised to finish the job, and uh, the world has committed to finishing the job, um, and yet it still doesn't have the policies and budgets in place to do it. So our advocacy for widespread adoption, our continuing to be pioneers at the cutting edge, are critical to this future. Um, I 
thank you all for everything you do and for being here today. Um, I will, and my colleagues will probably be here for a bit afterwards this event, but this event is now over. So thank you all very much. The music, stop the music. There's a, as you may have seen on the program, there's a women in, there's a, shh, there's a, there's a brunch tomorrow.